Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Jay DeLeon. I'm the Director of Engagement here at NYU Skirball. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Skirball Talk. Uh, Skirball Talks is our free Monday night speaker series organized in partnership with departments and centers across campus. And we have four more great events upcoming in April. Uh, and you can learn more about them at RSVP on our website, nyuskirball.org. Now please join me in welcoming Crystal Parikh, Professor of English and Social and Cultural Analysis and the Director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm Crystal Parikh, as Jay said. I'm the Director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. And it's my pleasure to welcome to you tonight to tonight's Skirball Talk featuring Linda Sarsour. I'd like to thank the co-sponsors for tonight's event, NYU Sanctuary, NYU Center for Multicultural Education and Programs, the Islamic Center at NYU, NYU Hagop uh, Kevorkian Center for N Near Eastern Studies, NYU Jewish Voice for Peace, NYU Students for Justice in Palestine, and Jewish Voice for Peace in New York City. And of course, thank you to our host, NYU Skirball. Can you give me a hand? Thanks. On a personal note, I'd like to thank the APA Institute staff um, for their tireless efforts in making tonight's event possible. I'd also like to take a moment for us to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would also like to recognize that New York City is currently home to 100,000 people who identify as indigenous, um, including many peoples from the Pacific. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Tonight's... <laughs> Tonight's event is part of the Institute's year-long thematic focus on migration, refugees, and the politics of sanctuary. Our current ex exhibition, We Imagine Sanctuary, created by artist uh, Jess X. Snow and APA Institute um, at NYU artist-in-residence, Ushka, in collaboration with NYU undergraduates, and is on view at the gallery at 8 Washington Muse um, through May 10th, and we encourage you to come visit us there. I'd like to offer um, some guidelines for tonight's events. We know there may be some in the audience who might not agree with the organizers or our invited speakers, um, and we would um, hope that everyone is um, able to provide our guests a courtesy to speak on the theme of migration, refugees, and the politics of sanctuary. We ask that you remain conscientious about this topic, which is of such enormous urgency at the present moment. We encourage you to listen, learn, and save your questions for the note cards, um, which, you, which will be collected periodically um, from the audience um, during the lecture. Um, so please be sure, if you do have questions, um, to pass those note cards to the end of your aisle. Um, where they will be collected. We also encourage you to post tonight to social media using the hashtag NYU Skirball Talks. And now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our speech speakers this evening. Linda Sarsour is an award-winning racial justice and civil rights activist, seasoned community organizer, and mother of three. Ambitious, outspoken, and independent, Sarsour shatters stereotypes of Muslim women while also treasuring her religious and ethnic heritage. As a Palestinian Muslim American and self-proclaimed new, uh, pure New Yorker born and uh, raised in Brooklyn, she is the former di uh, executive director of the Arab American Association of New York and the co-founder of the first Muslim online organizing um, platform, Empowered change. Sarsour has been at the forefront of major civil rights campaigns, including calling for an end to unwarranted surveillance of New York's, uh, New York's Muslim communities and ending police policies like stop and frisk. In the wake of the police murder of Mike Brown, she co-founded Muslims for Ferguson to build solidarity amongst American Muslim communities and encourage work against police brutality. She is a member of the Justice League NYC, a leading uh, NYC force of activists, formerly incarcerated individuals, and artists working to reform the New York Police Department and the criminal justice system. Sarsour co-chaired the March to Justice, a 250-mile journey on foot to deliver a justice package to end racial profiling, demilitarize police, and demand the government invest in young people and communities. 
She was instrumental in the Coalition for Muslim School Holidays to push New York City to incorporate two Muslim high, holiday, high holy holidays and into the NYC public school calendar. New York City is now the largest school system in the country to officially recognize these holidays. Sir Sir is also a senior fellow at the Auburn Seminary along uh, leading social justice faith leaders. And she was the national co-chair of the 2017 Women's March in Washington, dubbed the largest single day protest in US history. She serves on the executive board of Women's March, Inc., where she focuses on fundraising and direct action planning. Sarsour has received numerous awards and honors, including the Champion of Change from the White House, the WCA's uh, USA's Women of Distinction Award for Advocacy and Civic Engagement, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, the Andrew Young Foundation's um, Annual International Leaders Award, the Ch Shirley Chilson Award by the New York City Council, and was recognized by the NAACP New York State Conference. Sarsour was named among 500 of the most influential Muslims in the world, 50 of the world's greatest leaders by Fortune Magazine, Essence Magazine, Woke 100 and featured on Time one, Time's 100 uh, list of the world's most influential people. Sarsour was profiled on the front page of the New York Times Metro section dubbed uh, Brooklyn Homegirl in a Hijab, and she was written for and has been featured in local, national, and international media discussing impact of domestic policies that target Arab and Muslim American communities, criminal justice issues, immigration, and Middle East affairs. Sarsour is well respected amongst diverse communities in both New York City and nationally, and she is most recognized for her transformation transformative, intersectional, organizing work, and movement building. Joining Linda, um, on, uh, Linda Sarsour on stage um, after her talk will be uh, Dr. Paula Chakravarti. Paula Chakravarti is associate professor in the NYU Department of Media, Culture, and Communication and the NYU Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Prior to NYU, she taught at U University of Massachusetts Amherst and the University of California, San Diego. She was born in India and grew up as an immigrant in, Tex in the Texas of Canada, Calgary, um, Alberta. Um, her research and teaching span political economy, migrant labor, social movements, and critical race theory. Her books include Race, Empire, and the Crisis of the Subprime, published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2013, Media Policy and Globalization by Edinburgh uh, University Press in 2006, and Global Communications Towards a Transcultural Political Economy, which was published by Roman and Littlefield Publishers in 2000. And eight. Her recent publications include a co-written uh, article on communication so white and a special issue on mediatized popul populism's inter-Asian lineages uh, for the International Communi Journal of Communication, um, which was uh, published in December of 2017. Her current research focuses on racial capitalism and global media infrastructures and low-wage migrant mobility and claims for justice. Chuck Rivardi is a member of the NYU Sanctuary Coalition and the NYU Coalition for Fair Labor. She serves on the executive committee of the NYU Association of U for University professors and is affiliate is an affiliate uh, faculty at the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU, South Asia at NYU, and the NYU Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern Studies. So please now join me in welcoming Linda Sarser. Thank you. What up, New York City? I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you everyone. I appreciate that. So let's, let's just get to it. And I wanted to make one quick clarification from that fabulous inter introduction when you said that I got the champion of change from the White House. Let's be clear which White House. Because <laughs> you know it wasn't this White House. I'm just deeply honored and humbled uh, to be here today with all of you, and I thank all the organizers of this event. Um, when I came out, you were probably like, really? Like this lady? Like, the fact that somebody like me can just attract this kind of controversy is really interesting. But I hope, but I hope that my folks in the room who don't agree with me or think that they don't agree with me um, give me a chance, and then maybe afterwards you can ask me the real questions you want to ask me. We can talk about all the things that you want to talk about. I promise to directly answer your questions. But I have some important work to do. And I hope that um, we leave here today understanding that we are in a very serious situation. Before I get to the very serious situation that we are in, I want you to know that I came here today to NYU unapologetically Palestinian American. And I came here 
unapologetically Muslim American. And many of you know me very well, and you know I'm gonna come here unapologetically from Brooklyn, New York. So I'm grounded in a particular moment right now, and sometimes I'm not sure if we're all watching the same news or we're kind of understanding what's happening around us. So I came here because I just want to speak some truth. And my truth is not other people's truth. And sometimes the truth makes some people feel uncomfortable. And what I'm going to ask you to do is when you feel uncomfortable by something that I'm saying, I want you to sit with it for a second. I want you to ask yourself, what is it about what she's saying that is making me feel uncomfortable? We're living in a moment right now where we have to realize that we are complicit in horror and trauma and pain against communities. You are living in a time just within the last two years where this administration decided to target young undocumented people and rescind the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival program. So there's about one million young people who were safer before they had DACA because now the government has their information. And by extension, their 11 million members of their families are in risk of deportation. Caging children at the border, ripping babies from their mothers, and over 1,500 sexual assaults against members of the federal government on these young children taken from their parents. We have a president that calls the media the enemy of the people. We have rescinded 200,000 El Salvadorans from temporary protected status, 60,000 Haitians, Vietnamese, we've done Muslim ban, Muslim ban one, two, three, four, and now we went to the Supreme Court and we lost in the Supreme Court. Now it is the law that the President of the United States of America, he or she, can decide at any moment to ban a particular group of people from whatever country they feel like it. We have banning trans people from the military, reversing protections for LGBTQ people. I mean, I can sit here, 23 million Americans kicked off of healthcare. I mean, you watch this online, people literally putting out GoFundMes just so that they can get a surgery or get some additional treatment that their insurance doesn't cover. This is all happening on our watch. We sold the largest arms deal to Saudi Arabia so they can kill poor innocent Muslims in Yemen. I mean, there is a lot of bad things that are happening in our country right now, and that's what I'm giving you is just a snippet. And we can talk about reproductive rights and states across the country passing anti-abortion bills. I mean, Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court and stacking up the Supreme Court with conservatives that are going to impact us for the next 40 years. And so what I'm here to say to all of you is that I don't care who you would have been at the time of the Civil Rights Movement or who you would have been at the time of any horrific moment in history. The question is, who are you right now? What are you doing right now? A lot of times people say to me, you're anti-American. You need to go back to where you came from. First of all, I came from Brooklyn. Let's just make that very clear. <laughs> and they'll say to me things like, go back to Saudi Arabia. First of all, even if I was to go back to where my family came from, it wasn't Saudi Arabia. And I don't know about anybody that wants to go live in Saudi Arabia, because I sure in hell ain't one of them. <laughs> and I say that to say that they say to me, you know, you're anti-American. You need to, you're not a patriot. You don't love this country. And I know why they say that. They say that because while I don't take for granted that my immigrant parents came here from living under the longest military occupation in modern history, to, to come here so that I can be born here and have the privileges that I do have in this country, that I get to come and stand on a stage in NYU and speak to people of all different backgrounds, I don't take that for granted. But just because my family came here to this country, I don't forget that this country has caused a lot of horror and trauma against many communities. It is not anti-American to remind us that we live in a country that was founded on the extermination of indigenous people. It's not anti-American to remind us that we live in a country that was founded on the enslavement of black people. That we segregated people by race. And I would argue with you in New York City that we still segregate people by race. We got the most segregated public school system in the country. Not only do we segregate people by race, we also segregate them by class. So we just add it on. 
We're a country that when they said Muslim ban, people said, Linda, they can't do that. They can't just ban people. We've done that before. The Chinese Exclusion Act. We passed a piece of federal legislation that actually said that this group of people from this country are not allowed to immigrate to the United States of America. We also interned Japanese Americans. That wasn't a long time ago. That was 77 years ago where we went around and rounded up Japanese Americans and put them into concentration camps on this U.S. soil. We also live in a country that has had mass deportation programs. Operation Wetback, where we deported two million Mexicans who did not cross the border, but the border crossed them. That was at a time where we did not have all this technology, where, there was not, where we did not have agencies like ICE. So what makes you think that we can't have a mass deportation program? We had it under President Obama. He was deporting 1,000 immigrants per day. I know you would love to have him back, and I'll take him back in a second, but we also got to speak the truth sometimes. We also said that we ended slavery. Everybody's always like, you got to get old. Why do black people keep talking about slavery? That, already, that was a long time ago. Actually, it wasn't that long ago. But also, today, in 2019, you live in a country that practices, practices modern-day slavery. And you're silent about it. What makes me believe that if you were around a couple of hundred years ago, or even a hundred years ago, that you were going to be some sort of abolitionist? You should be an abolitionist right now. We have mass incarceration in this country. That is modern day slavery. It's not okay, it's not okay for us to live in a country where we hold 25% of the world's prison population. It's not okay. It's not okay as the country that doesn't have the largest or most populated, we're not the most populated nation, for us to hold one out of, one out of four prisoners. That makes no sense. But generally speaking, yes, there's a movement to end mass incarceration in this country, but guess what? There still is a quite large, silent majority. And so what I say to people all the time is, I'm not anti-American. In fact, if there was a photo in the dictionary with the word patriot, I would it would be my picture there. Because a real patriot, a real patriot loves their country so much that they push their country to be better to respect every single person that lives in our country with us. I love my country. I want my country to be the beacon of hope, of human rights. I want our nation to be able to say we respect everybody in this country. When people say to me, you're a leftist or all, first of all, I don't ever say about myself that I'm from the left. I don't allow people to put any labels on me. And people will say, your ideas are radical. And I always ask people, I'm just really trying to understand, and you can help me, because I'm, maybe I'm just confused. What's so radical about believing that everybody deserves access to health care? What's so, what's so radical about believing that college students shouldn't graduate with college debt and be paralyzed for the rest of their lives? What's so radical about that? What's so, what's so radical about believing that our undocumented neighbors who live with us, who sometimes take care of our children, who are our fellow students, who are people who live in our communities, sometimes we, they are in our families, what's so radical about believing that they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect in our country? What's so radical about that? What's so radical about believing that LGBTQIA people deserve to be safe in every space that they're in. What's so radical about that? I'm trying to understand what is so left about that. What's left or right about that? There's a lot of things that I, that's right, sis. That's what I'm talking about. She, she's all in. So, so what I say to folks in this room is that, you know, what's so radical about being anti-war? What's so radical about being against the military industrial complex and then reprioritizing and saying, you know what, we can do a lot better with that, with those resources. We can put it back into our crumbling infrastructure, our, 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 our mediocre public education systems in this country. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with being anti-war and being pro-peace and pro-diplomacy? That's what I am. So don't tell me about what's left or right. I'm pro-human. I'm pro-people being able to live and not only survive in our communities, I want people to thrive in our communities. There's nothing left or right about that. People know me very well. I'm not no representative of the Democratic Party. In fact, if you want to ask people in the Democratic Party, they'd probably be like, nope, she ain't with us. 
I'm a small D, a little small D. And I happen to choose a party that's a little bit better than another party, at least, in, at least from my personal experience. And they may, they, another party may be good for other people. This is not a partisan conversation. It's about what kind of country do you want to live in? And so what I say to people in this movement that we're a part of right now, there's a lot of people that are talking about this term that they just heard about like five minutes ago. Because you know, everything's a trend. Everybody wants to be part of a trend. And they keep talking about intersectionality. And people define intersectionality whatever way they want to, whatever makes them feel comfortable. That's not how the world works. There is an actual definition for intersectionality. And it actually came from somewhere. So you can't, it didn't just pop up. Intersectionality is a term that was coined by a black woman scholar named Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. And Dr. when Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw offered academia this term, just to be clear, she didn't say that intersectionality was black people and the white people and the Latinos and the Muslims and the Jews and the atheists organizing together. That's not what intersectionality is. And if that's what you think it is, then you got to delete and start over. Because that's the problem that we have. Intersectionality is not about people organizing together or different people organizing together. It's the idea about organizing at the intersections of oppression. It's about this idea that you can't organize around gender justice without also organizing around economic justice and racial justice and reproductive rights and environmental justice, that you can't combat anti-black racism with, without also combating Islamophobia and xenophobia and anti-Semitism and ableism, right? And homophobia and transphobia. Because what happens is we forget that there are people in our community who live with multiple identities. So what if you're a black trans woman? What happens to you? You have to experience anti-black racism and transphobia. So why are we going to ask people to break themselves up into different movements? And that's why we have lost a lot of important fights. So let's get into that for a second. Where do we go wrong? Organizing on any issue, including immigration and immigrant rights. We're organizing in silos. Racial justice people are over here. The folks working to, for Medicare for All are, are up there. Environmental justice people are in the middle. The, the, the racial justice, anti-police brutality, criminal justice reform people are over here. The LGBTQ rights folks are in the other corner. The Muslims are over here. And then we're all organizing separately. And what happens when we organize separately? People get left off the table. Or people are asked to have to pick and choose where they want to be and what they prioritize parts of their identity. Audre Lorde told us there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. So why do the movements separate us? And not only do the movements separate us, the way that we've been organizing has separated us, which is why we're in this new moment where people are not coming into terms with how we're going to organize when we come together and bring our movements together. People will say, but Linda, we've won some campaigns this way. The environmental justice people have gotten some wins. The immigrant rights people have gotten some wins. I always ask people, labor has gotten some wins. The question is, who lost when you won? Who had to lose for you to win? We've had this in New York many times. Our labor friends would go in fighting for wages or some contract. But then when they get in there, they say, don't talk to us about those undocumented kids who want that tuition assistance. We got you, but you got to, when the Muslims are fighting, they're like, we'll talk about stop and frisk, but don't talk about us. Talk to us about that, unwarrant, that surveillance program. We need the surveillance stuff. Like, we can't, come on, we can't do everything. We'll help you. And oftentimes, what we have done in the movement is we've thrown each other under the bus. I don't want to be part of a movement like that. I want to be part of a movement where we either win together or we lose together. At least when we lose, we lose with integrity and without leaving anybody behind. So we need a, a holistic approach to the way in which that we organize, to social justice work. And I want to talk a little bit about, as someone who is a leader in the progressive movement, there's some things that we got to understand. I don't know about what we're trying to do here, and maybe other people have different goals, but let me tell you what my goal is. I'm not trying to be part of a movement where we all agree on everything. Because that's not actually possible. 
It's actually not realistic. So if that's what you're waiting for, it's never going to happen. So I'm helping you by telling you to give up because it's just not going to happen. And the reason why I say that is because there's this expectation on the movement for all of us to be on the same page, but then we're not even on the same page with people in our families. You can't even agree with people in your family and you expect to come to the movement and agree with strangers. This is just not how it works. So what I say to people that my goal in the movement is not unity. Unity in the sense that we're all gonna come out with one package, we're all gonna uh, agree on all the same policy solutions, we're all gonna have the same political positions, we're all gonna be part of the same party. That's not why I'm here. Because for me, unity is not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. And it's not going to be uniformity in this movement. And what I say to people, and just to be a little bit more specific about what I'm saying, for example, I'm Palestinian. I'm a light-skinned Arab born and raised in Brooklyn. And one of the movements that I'm very committed to is I'm committed to black liberation. I'm committed to ending police brutality. I'm committed to dismantling an injustice system, not the justice system, the injustice system. So when I go to the table or I meet people in New York City who have lost their children to police violence, or I sit at tables with black-led organizers, I have never went to a table and said, before I sit and organize with you, raise your hand if you believe in a free Palestine. Raise your hand if you support the boycott divestment sanction movement. You do not come into a movement space and put conditions on the movement. This is not how it works. So what happens eventually in the movement, I'm giving tips to folks here, take it, write it down. The way that I've been able to share my story in the movement is I come to spaces and gave myself wholeheartedly to those spaces. Gave my skills, my talents, my passion, and my heart to the things that move me. And then what happens later on is someone turns to you a few months later, maybe a year later, and says, where did you come from? And I say, what do you mean? I said, tell me your story. And that gives me an opportunity to say who I am, and who I am is core to who and how I show up in the movement. I am a daughter of Palestinian immigrants who came here from living under a military occupation. My family still lives under a military occupation. I still see people who look like me who live in an open air prison in Gaza. So when I carry the positions that I have, I hope that you expect me to have these positions. And in fact, if I didn't have these positions, you should be quite worried about me. And so what happens in the movement is I'm able to share my story. I'm able to tell people where I came from. I'm able to share my pain, where it hurts for me. And guess what? We all hurt. We all have trauma. We all come from communities where there is trauma. But we have to be able to be part of building relationships in order to share our pain and trauma with others so we can find ways to address that trauma together. And when I say that also, it doesn't mean that Anybody in the movement carries a, you know, or stands at the door and says, tell me what your political positions are in order to, for me to allow you to be on the table. That's not how it works in the movement. Everybody's welcome to the table. Now, that doesn't mean that when you're at the table, someone's not going to say something that is in opposition to a, a particular position you have. Or it doesn't mean because you're at the table that you're not going to feel uncomfortable. Of course you're going to be uncomfortable. Because like I said earlier, unity is not uniformity. If you care about undocumented people, you're going to have to come to the table and say, I'm ready to put it all in for undocumented people. I'm going to go all in for the Muslims. I'm going to go all in for our Jewish sisters and brothers. I'm going to go all in for, you know, LGBTQIA people without any conditions to your solidarity. And then eventually someone will turn to you and say, what is your story? Where does it hurt? Tell me so I can be with you just like you have been with me. That's how the movement is, and that's the kind of movement that I want to be a part of. And it's not going to go well for you if you think that coming to the movement requires that you put conditions on the people of the movement, because what happens is the opposite happens. And the movement is a place where everybody gets heard. It doesn't mean that your issue becomes prioritized, but you will be heard in this movement. One of the things that I'll say to everybody here is that we got to come to terms also with how we're going to win. And everybody has a different vision. I'm a visionary. I think about things 20, 30, 40 years from now. We live in a country with changing demographics. There's nothing you can do about that. We're going to become a browner country. That's just life. It's a cycle. It's just how it is. 
I'm not out here. I don't have a clinic or some place where like some lab where we're making more brown babies in there. <laughs> we're really not doing that. My people are pretty good about that baby making business, but <laughs> it's not me that's leading that charge. I got, I have three. I stop. I gave my contribution to the world. And I say that to say that it's okay. I'm actually really excited about it. And I know a lot of people who are excited about the changing demographics of our country. But what we also have to realize is when there's changing demographics, guess what else changes? Leadership changes. Influencers change. And now we're watching it right before our very eyes. We're watching what happens when women of color come into leadership. Two things happen. We'll talk about the positive for a second, and then we'll talk about the ne negative for a second. The positive. When women of color are in leadership, they don't leave anybody behind. And when women of color are in leadership, guess what? You're, 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 you're like, wait a minute. Oh, man, everybody's talking about health care now. It's not just our old Jewish uncle Bernie Sanders talking about health care. Now you have all the women of color leading on health care, including the lead sponsor of the Medicare for All bill in the House is an Asian, an Indian woman. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. That's what we're talking about right now. College education, ending the debt in college. When was the last time that was a mainstream conversation in, co in Congress? But it is now. Immigrants, temporary protected status, right? Now, now we're going into a new, and you'll hear about it very soon, there's going to be a bill that's going to start working on repealing the Muslim ban and the asylum ban and the travel ban and the refugee ban. People of color talking about the things we've always wanted to talk about, housing crisis. Rashida Tlaib recently introduced a bill about something that people might have not thought was that important, but it is important. Guess what? Being able to get car insurance without your credit score being used against you, which also impacts mostly poor people. And guess who? Poor people of color, black people in particular. So now you have women of color who are leading and talking about anti-war, anti-imperialism. I'm not going to lie to you, when I watched Representative Ilhan Omar go after Elliot Abrams, <laughs> having, having a black refugee who saw war, who saw people that looked like her dismembered and had to live in a refugee camp for four years, sit in Congress and question a war criminal, that is the American dream right there. That is what we have been working for right there. And I say this all the time, and many people have heard me say this before about people of color. It's not that white people don't have important positions. It's not that we don't want white people in our movement. White people are in our movements. They are in all of our movements. Guess who? When you talk about the pro-Palestine movement, guess who's at the forefront of the pro-Palestine movement? Jewish people at the, at the forefront of the, of the Palestinian rights movement. We have our white allies getting arrested in civil disobedience. We have them helping us resource our movement. They're always at, in our movement spaces. But I always ask people to think about this for one second. Why not follow people of color? Because people of color are the most directly impacted by injustice. So guess who wants justice first? the people impacted by the injustice. So I want to follow the people who are trying to get to the justice first. And that is going to be the people who are the most pained and traumatized and broken in our country. And they are oftentimes poor people of color and members of other marginalized communities. And so, We, I'm a, like I said earlier, I'm a visionary. I, th I think about things 40 years from now. I work towards things that I may never see the fruits of my labor of, and I have seen some fruits of my labor. But I want to think about things 50 years from now. But 2019, I'm going to be a little short-sighted. 2020, people. What are we going to do? This is not no ordinary election. This is not, you know oh, I don't know if I like this one and this one, I don't agree with her on this issue. I don't know about this guy on that. It's not going to be about that. So what I'm going to say to all of you is this. Pick somebody that you like. 
I don't know, sometimes I think people think the election is like, let me pick a friend. You're not picking a friend. You really aren't. You're not going to be having lunch or dinner with these people. So it doesn't matter if you like them. It's not about if you like them. It's about who is the best in the moment, knowing that the election is going to happen with or without you. So pick somebody. And then when you pick them, participate. Knock on doors, fundraise, excite people, register voters, do whatever it is that you need to do. But when that primary is over, because it's going to be over, it's going to feel like a long time, but it'll be over soon, we got to be on the same team. We got to be on the same team. And here's, what the, here's the choice that you're going to have in 2020. Very simple. Fascism, not fascism. <laughs> That's the old, that is really it. Everything else is irrelevant. Just saying. So that's where I'm going to be focused for the next year or so, a year and a half. Hopefully, I want to be able to say, look, my country, we were almost going down there, but we came right back up. And we didn't elect the fascists for four more years. That's all. It's not that complicated. It really isn't. And it would be a great story for us to have, especially as people who pr proclaim to be the leaders of the free world. And I will end by saying this. I want you to be really, really careful. Because people will argue with me about this, about, Linda, you know, do we actually live under fascism right now? Now, listen, if you're going to compare our fascism with other forms of fascism, obviously there's going to be a good, robust argument there. But just the things that I've described, we're pretty much almost there. And so what I'm saying to people here in this room is that when, we, when, we're, when you're living under kind of an authoritarian, right, or someone that it comes off as an authoritarian, you got to be really careful about how that translates amongst our communities. So you ever wonder why somebody would want to figure out how to pin up Jewish Americans and Muslim Americans? Who benefits from that? Who benefits of, from dividing these communities? Who benefits from dividing black people from Jews, who, by the way, there are black Jews, let's be clear, right? Who, 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 benefits from, who benefits from the divisions? Not us, not Jewish people, not Muslims. We don't benefit. In fact, you know what that does? It's divide and conquer. It actually makes us all vulnerable. So I don't play into that, right? It happens to me all the time. I'm not going to play into it because it's actually not true. Jews and Muslims in New York in particular, we've had a long-standing relationship for a long time before I was even born. I've talked to many elders. We have organized on issues here in New York. Black people, non-black Jews have organized for decades together. So let's be very clear about one thing. Can we disagree? Because listen, disagreement is good. You got your convictions, I got mine, everybody does. Can we disagree without dividing our communities? Can we say, I don't agree with this lady? It's cool, I'm telling you, I'm not here to convince anybody to believe what I believe. I just want to live in a country that allows me to believe what I want to believe. That's all I want. So what I'm saying to you when you leave here today, that we are in a serious situation as a country. And, we, and I have explained many things that our country has done and that I will say to all of you in this room, there's nothing that reassures me that bad things cannot happen in this country to our to community. We've seen it already happen. Just recently we've seen it happen. So I'm, I'm saying to all of you here today, let us leave this room understanding that we have a mission and that we all agree in this room that everybody, every single person who resides in these United States of America deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, and that we in this country want to be the leaders of the, in the world when it comes to human rights, and that in order for us to be able to critique everybody else, let's clean up our house together, and then we can worry about everybody else that's doing and engaging in God knows what on the other side of the world. So I want to say that I appreciate all of you for being here today, and even the ones that don't agree with me, I appreciate you. I actually welcome you into the space, and I hope that there could come a time, there's actually a, a, a young man that I'm not going to call out by name who's in this audience, 
who actually used to be a Trump supporter. And he actually used to troll me on Twitter, like used to troll the hell out of me on Twitter. I'm serious. It was to the point where I usually block trolls. Something in my heart told me there's something about this guy. I'm not going to block him. And a lot of my friends who are in this room, and we all started engaging with him on social media. We would talk to him. We would engage him. Why do you believe what you believe? What's going on? Conversation after conversation. Guess what? He just changed his party. And we went and met for the first time just a few weeks ago. We, we were able to have some halal kosher pastrami <laughs> sandwiches that were fabulous. But my point is to say that even this young man, who literally was the ultimate troll of mine, like he was my troll, like he was like assigned to me. <laughs> and now I would consider him someone that I can engage in a respectful conversation. And he has been able to say, you know what, I see where you're coming from. It doesn't mean that he agrees with me on everything. He absolutely does not. But he was able to see me as a human being, as a person, that he can say, I can agree with you on some things and not agree with you on other things. But you know what? You're still a human being that is deserving of my respect. And that's all I'm asking for. That's all I'm asking for. So thank you for doing that here today. And I'm looking forward to a great conversation right now. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone, and I think we're all pretty jazzed to talk to Linda after that great speech, so let's, um, let's give her another round of applause, and thank you for being here. Okay, so let me just go over um, how this is going to work. We're going to, Linda and I are going to have a little conversation for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I get to ask her some burning questions that I have, having um, been an observer of Linda for, for a while now. Um, and then I will, um, uh, we've, we've asked for questions on note cards, and I will uh, read out questions that have been given to us from audience members. Okay, so that's how, how it will work, and we'll go until about 8 o'clock. Okay. So, Linda, my first question has to do really with the theme for tonight's talk, which is on migration, refugees, and the politics of sanctuary, and, and you began with this. Um, I'd like to start on a more personal note and ask you, um, for myself, as a daughter of immigrants whose parents' experiences with racism shaped my own early thinking about immigration and racism and activism, I'm curious about your personal experiences as a Palestinian-American in Brooklyn um, and, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how your family, your parents, your kids have shaped your thinking about advocating for immigrant rights here in New York City and also nationally. Thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you, Paula. Um, so as I told you, my parents are Palestinian immigrants from the West Bank. My parents came here um, in the late 1970s. I was born in 1980. It was my birthday, actually, just this past week. Um, <laughs> And my experience, you know, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn like it's a human being. Like, I love Brooklyn very much. And it shaped, it really shaped who I am. And my parents have that typical story. You know, you come poor to America and you want to work your hardest um, to, 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 you know, get that American dream. My father was a small business owner out in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. My mom was a housewife. I'm the oldest of seven children. Uh, my mom had seven children in a span of 10 years. So when I was 10... My mom already had seven kids, and I was the oldest. Um, so I've been a leader before my time. Um, I did a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have been doing at the age of 10, but I was an adult um, a long time ago before adulthood became adulthood. Um, and so my experience has been you know, learning about where I came from, and that's why it has shaped who I am. You know, I, I have a particular immigrant story of a family who lived under a military occupation, you know, and experiences and stories from my grandmother who was born in 19, uh, 21 years before the creation of the State of Israel. And, and my grandmother remembers times. You know, I, know, I know about a time, I know what coexistence with people looks like because my grandmother told me that they lived in coexistence and peace with Jews before the creation of the State of Israel. I understood that I had the lineage of an oppressed people in my blood and that my parents told me that whatever you do, wherever you go, they're going to try to erase us. They're going to try to move us out more. There's going to be a day where there may not be a Palestine. And my mom said that my 
role was and my responsibility of, that, of my sisters and brothers is that we carry Palestine, that Palestine is here in my heart. And it's also in my voice and it's in my steps and it's in the way that I show up for other oppressed communities. And so that's who I am and that's my immigrant story and my parents um, have given everything so that I can be who I am today. And I honor them by defending other immigrants and immigrant communities in this country, not just those who come from the same part of the world that I come from. Thank you. You talked uh, a lot in your, in your remarks about um, the kind of progressive intersectional coalition building that you've been involved in. Um, and um, you talked about this commitment that you have to unity is not uniformity, right? You, you discussed this in an uh, interview in the Washington Post recently. You brought it up today. And I just wonder how you square that because it, it's, a, it's a complicated um, idea. Right to, to advocate publicly. And I just wonder, how do you do that in this current moment of dog whistle politics and of a media culture that loves a good fight? Right. So you're advocating something that is really pushing us to think in complex ways about coalitions and to think about differences and coming up with moments of unity. You know, as you're being trolled uh, relentlessly, and as um, especially progressive women of color um, are attacked viciously. So I'm just wondering how you square that, you know, sort of thinking through the antagonism, the antagonism of the media culture that we live in right now with this unity and difference. I'm like at the center of every big fight. <laughs> I, it's, it's basically, I become a, a symbol of this intersectionality. I become the, what we don't want in America, right? We, we don't want to see progressive Muslim women who are unapologetic about who we are and are challenging the status quo because what happens when we do that is we're actually literally single-handedly, some of us, like Ilhan and Rashid and others, we are dismantling stereotypes and propaganda that has been built up about our communities and where we came from for a really long time. And somebody and some people have spent millions of dollars on that propaganda and they're like, listen, this return investment is not working out for us. Gotta figure out what to do. And so the way that the response is instead of, and I say to this people all the time, if you have a disagreement in the movement or a disagreement just in general, at, you know, in, in the public about a particular issue, like let's say, let's use this as an example. Israel-Palestine is, is that issue oftentimes that comes up. There's a lot of differences that we have on that. Whether you support a one state or a two state, whether you support BDS, whether you don't support BDS, all kinds of things, right? So I always say to people, cool, let's disagree. Why don't you, who have opposing views to mine, appeal to the morals and values of the people? Instead of using your time to vilify, dehumanize, and otherize us for our positions. That's all I'm saying. Like, I want to hear you. Why don't you support voice? What's the, what's the reason why you don't support a Palestinian state? What's the reason? And so I want to hear it. But oftentimes, we never have those conversations because people are too busy trying to make us the enemy. Instead of saying, here's why I disagree with you. Here are my values, and here are what I believe, right? And being able to share with that and being able to have a conversation like a respectful one where we're not, you know, engaging in op-ed after op-ed or coming to events and heckling, but actually writing somebody an email, no, writing somebody an email which publicly exists and saying, hey, I got these questions for you. I'd like to hear your answers to these questions. In fact, I'd be happy to meet you and a couple of friends somewhere to have this conversation. So what I say about unity is not uniformity is I say that there's too much at stake, which is why it's not that it's, not that it's hard to sell. It's that we have to do it. We got to figure out how to organize together. Because whatever you and I believe about Israel-Palestine, that's not going to get solved tomorrow or next year or even in 10 years. But you know what? There are people right now in our country who are being murdered at the hands of police, that are being deported and separated from their families. There are Muslim families who are being separated by a Muslim ban. There are li there's literally fascists in the White House right now. And we're having these little debates in the corner with people who are not, have absolutely no influence on what's I have no influence on what happens in Middle Eastern politics. But I just got an opinion about it just like I do about everything else. So for me, <laughs> this, this idea of organizing 
in a movement where unity is not uniformity just means that when there are people hurting, you drop everything and you go to where the people are hurting and you uplift them. I don't give a damn who you are, what you believe. If there's a hurricane in this country and you're picking up people's belongings, you're saving people, I don't give a damn who, if you're a Republican, if you're a Green Party or you're a socialist or a communist or an atheist. It doesn't matter to me who you are. Come to the aid of people who are the most broken in our country. And that's the thing that I never just understood. It's like, why can't we do that? I never went to a movement and asked people to fill out a form and say, please tell me all your political views. That's not how it works. And so for me, it's not about I'm trying to sell this new, you know, fad to the movement. We got no choice. There's not enough of us out here. There's not enough of us to say these people are going to do all the saving and then we're going to keep out everybody else. No, I need you and you and you and everybody right now in this moment. And that's why it's going to require that we are ready to say we're going to organize. Look, I don't agree with you, lady, on these things. And Monday, you and I are going to have to have a very important, courageous conversation. But for now, I'm going to meet you at the border because I want to make sure those people are safe at the border. That's what I'm asking for. That's it. Um, we'll move to the audience questions in, in a few minutes. Um, I have two more questions for you, um, Linda. Uh, one really has to do with the, the issue of Palestine that you brought up. And as you probably know, um, at NYU, um, student activists um, have passed a divestment uh, resolution through the Student Senate. <laughs> I think, I think what is interesting, you know, for me, I've been teaching for a long, a long time, and it, it, it's interesting to see this kind of generational shift. You know, this generational shift when it comes to progressive politics, um, generational shift when it comes to talking about American foreign policy and militarism, generational shift on the issue of Palestine. And I, um, I just, I wonder what your thoughts are about how um, the role of the BDS movement the role of the issue of Palestine in the future of US politics, especially on campuses where clearly a lot of people are paying attention. I mean, the statistics, I'm not the, I'm not the researcher, the statistics are telling us that more young people are becoming more progressive on this issue. And it's actually the framing of this idea of being more progressive is weird, right? Like, human rights for Palestinian people, I don't know, like, why that's a progressive issue? Why is that not like a regular issue? Like, humans deserve human rights? I don't know. Um, and I want to be really clear about this whole BDS thing because that's, that's like the thing that everybody gets me on. It's like a gotcha moment. Like she supports BDS. That's it. And it ends there. And it's like, <laughs> it's really interesting. You know, the Palestinian people are not like so profound that they woke up one morning and were like, we're going to start some new thing that nobody ever did before. Boy, boycott divestment sanctions is actually tactics. There, it's not an organization. It's a ta are, these are tactics that have been used before. BDS has been used, you know, to end South African apartheid. Like, that's not, we didn't come up with that. It's not a, a thing that we just created or the Palestinian civil society created. They called on people to engage in boycott, divestment, sanction. I'm going to offer you something here. There's only, there's, <laughs> I'm getting to you. Don't worry, ma'am. I got you. I got you, sis. BDS, let's be clear about boycotting or the call to boycott and divest from the state of Israel, is a non-violent movement. That's what it is. So hold on, hold on. Hold on. So there's non-violent resistance, non-violent resistance. Then there is armed resistance, right? Listen to me. There's armed resistance and there's non-violent resistance. Young students, there are young students who have decided that they want to be in the spirit of people like Dr. Martin Luther King and those who worked against South African apartheid decided to be nonviolent activists and resistors and that is why they support the boycott divestment sanctions movement. So all I'm saying, all I'm saying is in order to hold a state accountable for human rights violations, when you tell people not to engage in boycott, divestment, sanctions, what other alternative are you giving people? What other alternative is there? 
I am very proud as someone who's trained in Kingi and nonviolence to support a nonviolent movement that would not need to exist if Israel was not engaging in human rights against violations against the Palestinian people. So instead of, instead of us saying, instead of us saying, instead of us saying, stop BDSing, why don't we say end the occupation of the Palestinian people? Lift the siege on Gaza. So anyway, So I just want to say to the students in the school, I'm very proud of the work that you are doing. And don't ever feel intimidated. And in fact, this kind of response to you is actually what fuel, keeps fueling you to do the work more. So actually, I didn't pay these people to be here, but that was just for you. You know, like, God, when you ha if you didn't have opposition to what you were doing, I'd be really worried about you. If people weren't opposing you, because let me just be clear, and I'm going to say this and just, there has never been a moment in our history ever, where there was a truth teller or an effective organizer or a leader in this country that has never been vilified or demonized. Let's look, you can look up Dr. Martin Luther King 50 years ago, the most dangerous Negro in America. He was working with organizations blacklisted by the US government. He wrote you a letter from the Birmingham jail, not from the ivory towers of Congress. He was a victim of police brutality at the end of his life, 18 months before he was assassinated at the age of 39, which is how old I am. He was assassinated, right, for what he believed in because he went into exactly what you were saying. He went from specifically focusing on the upliftment and the rights of black people specifically, right, on these wins that he wanted, the get your right, voting rights, let's stop segregation. Then he realized it was much bigger than that. And then he started saying, whoa, whoa, militarism. And then he started saying, wait a minute, it's not just black people, it's poor people, to all poor people. So he started building a coalition, started bringing people together, started building this transformative movement. And guess what they did? They knew it was going to be powerful. So they killed him. So there has never been anybody in history, Malcolm X, you can name the leader in other parts of the world. When you become an effective organizer that brings people together for common cause, and you got just a little bit of charisma, they want to end you. And that's just what it is. So for me, I don't want you to be worried about me. I know my history. I know how this works. And I always say this to people right now. They can say anything they want about me right now. But 50 years ago, 50 years from now, you will look back at this moment. And you will be like, oh, we remember who the truth tellers were. And also, you will be walking down Colin Kaepernick Boulevard. Tell me. I'm going to tell you that that's really going to be out. Okay, I'm going to get to a few questions from the audience here. Um, the first one is, um, is probably something that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, the question is, given recent events in New Zealand, but also the Ilan Omar controversy, um, what, what does better Muslim-Jewish um, activism so, uh, relations look like? And how can we show um, each other how to uh, build a mo movement together. So to be clear, there have always been Jewish-Muslim relations, um, particularly in this country and even in, 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 in the Muslim world, although others want to tell you otherwise. This past week w and was a great example of what that looks like. Um, and I don't know if people remember right after the Pittsburgh shooting um, where 11 innocent Jews were literally massacred in their synagogue, it was the Muslim community who stood up first for our Jewish sisters and brothers. We went to synagogues all across the country. And, I don't, and, and I'm just going to say this here because technically if I tell you this as a Muslim, I believe that all my good deeds just got erased, but I'm just going to say it here. Because um, when you do good, you're not, it's not, you don't do good for public to say that you did good. You did good so that God can see that you did good, that you did it for the right reasons. But right after the Pittsburgh shooting, I raised over $205,000 for uh, the Jewish victims um, in the synagogue. And I want to tell you just a little bit of a story about that. It's not about the money, because one of the things that the Muslim community, I will say about my own community, we are a generous community, um, and we will always show up when needed, and we've done it many times before. But there was a good story that went along with that. Of course, there were people in the opposition that wanted to even make a controversy about that, but this is what they didn't know happened. So some folks um, in some parts of the media, more conservative media, wanted to say because when we did a contract with the um, Pittsburgh uh, uh, synagogue, the Tree of Life, to transfer the money, we raised the money on LaunchGood, which is a Muslim-led fundraising platform. 
And as folks who have raised money on these, you know, GoFundMe and CrowdRise, you don't get the money right away. So you could raise a million dollars in a day. You're not going to get the million dollars tomorrow. And we knew, based on similar traditions in the Jewish faith and in the Muslim faith, around how people have to be buried in a particular time frame, we, try, we had to figure out how to get the money as soon as possible. So what happened? The Islamic Center of Pittsburgh, which is the neighbor of the Tree of Life, mm -hmm. called us up and said, I know that you can't get that money right away because of the way that this platform is set up. We will transfer right now $185,000 to, to the Pittsburgh Synagogue. That's what happened. So what did we do? The Muslims that did the fundraiser, we then ended up transferring the money from the Launch Good campaign to the Islamic Center because they're the ones that put up the money to the, to the Tree of Life. And then what did people say? The Muslims stole the money. I'm serious. There were members, some members of the Jewish community that literally accused the Muslims who stood up who put their, not thoughts and prayers, but put their money on it. Because that's how much solidarity, they, they, we believe solidarity is not in words, it's in action. And when a, when, a, when a small Islamic center figured out and said, we have whatever operating money we have in our, we know we're gonna get it back, so we trust you, we're gonna transfer the money. This is solidarity. This is the kind of relationship that Jews and Muslims have and should have in these United States of America. After the New Zealand shooting, Jewish members of different congregations went and stood outside, including here, outside the Islamic Center at NYU, greeting those who came to pray, showing messages of solidarity. This is how we're gonna, not only are, how we're gonna win, this is how we're gonna protect each other. Like the government is not here to protect any of us. They couldn't protect those 11 innocent Jews in the synagogue. They didn't protect the people in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. They didn't protect the nine black parishioners in Mother Emanuel Church. They didn't protect the mosque yesterday in San Diego that was arson in what they said was clear homage to the New Zealand attack. Who's gonna protect us but us? And so when you come to protect me, or if I come to your synagogue to protect you, you don't gotta worry about what I care about Palestine, Israel, or if I care, if I believe in a two-state solution, one state. We gotta learn how to understand that sanctuary is not a policy. I don't believe in, there are plenty sanctuary cities. Like in New York City, our mayor supposedly says we got a sanctuary city. Guess what? We've been arrested in New York City by NYPD and DHS in New York City. For those that were at the rally when Ravi was in detention center, you remember they were wearing Department of Homeland Security. I thought you said we were a sanctuary city. I was the one that took that video. I was like, DHS, NYPD together. That's the point of sanctuary that you don't work directly with federal contracts with the DHS. That's literally the whole definition of it. So what I say to people is that I don't believe in sanctuary policies in the same way that others do. What I do believe is in, in a sanctuary mentality. Sanctuary means how do you set up a community where we are all safe? And so when something bad happens, I want to know how my neighbor's going to protect me, right? I want to know what the role of the guy on the street, on the one that owns the bodega on the corner, is he with me? Could I hide in his facility? The guy that owns the building, that got a great basement that we could go all hide in? Are you ready to take in an undocumented family if, God forbid, there came a moment where agents were going around the country just picking up undocumented people like they are right now? Going to, we've seen them in New York. There's a lot of friends of mine here that work in legal aid. They come to housing court and pick up immigrants there. Are you ready to open your home to undocumented people? That's what sanctuary means. Sanctuary mean is not about the mayor saying that we're a sanctuary city of any city. It's not about what people in power think. It's about us and what we're willing to do for one another. And I have already proved what I'm willing to do. I'm, my life is on the line. I'm ready for it. I'm cool. I'm not asking anybody to feel bad for me. I made a decision that I'm ready to die for the things that I believe in. The question is, are we all ready for, to die for the things that we believe in? And that means that not allowing any more human beings to suffer while we watch in these United States of America. Okay, the next, uh, the next question moves to the, the Women's March issue. Um, handwriting is a little mess messy, people, but okay, I'll try do my best. Okay. <laughs> Um, there is a hierarchy of oppression in this country, and many white women marched for the first time in January of 2017. Are the most oppressed really supposed to join the second least oppressed in the hopes that they suddenly will see the, 
the disinterested masses march for them too. I think I think it says disinterested here. Yeah. So yeah, you get the point. Yeah, it's a good question. The white ladies win. They leave you behind like they've done before, and you want to know why? We should we go? You know, I get it. I know. I was there with you too. I was asking myself the same question. Let me quickly take you back and take you forward because this is really important. A lot of people who went to the 2017 march and, I, and, and they said, you know, and, and most people, they took, their grandmother went with the daughter and the granddaughter and it was really inspiring and people, it, it was the largest single day protest in American history, that's bottom line. So when the Women's March originally started, as you know, it started by a woman started a Facebook page. That's really, literally how this started. Let's just be clear about what these, this is very important in the movement because sometimes people get credit for things they didn't actually do. The white lady started a Facebook page. That's what happened. And it was actually called the Million Women's March. And then the women of color went in there, were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There was already a Million Women's March, and it was led by black women in Philadelphia in 1997. And then our black sisters, before the women of color went in, particularly black women, were like, are you sure you want to go in there? They're like, what's different now? Our mothers have done this before. Our grandmothers tried this before. We marched with them during the suffrage movement trying to get the right of women to vote, but guess what? We were there, but we didn't get the right to vote and nobody cared about us afterwards. Black women still didn't get a right to vote till like decades later. So there was a lot of criticism from women of color of whether or not we should join with, women of, with white women in the Women's March. So here's what our philosophy was as women of color who went in. There was gonna be a Women's March with or without us. That's just the bottom line. And we were about to let there be a moment where white women, majority of them, who by the way, the ones that are in the organizing are now my friends, so they know this and they'll tell you this themselves. They never organized a day in their lives. They didn't even know how to put a march together. Literally, they told us that. They were entrepreneurs, they were fashion entrepreneurs, they worked in tech, they were yoga teachers, social workers. I'm serious, that's who they were. And all of a sudden, Donald Trump becomes president and all of a sudden, everyone's outraged. They, they realized we had racism in America and there was misogyny and sexism and <laughs> oppression, seriously. Like, you saw it, it was like despair, people were crying, it was like, and the rest of us were like, welcome to our world. Like, and so that's why I always make this controversial statement that I'm gonna make here at NYU, which is, Donald Trump, there's a blessing in it. If it required Donald Trump to be president for everybody to realize all the hurt and pain in our country, then you know what? We'll figure out how to deal with him for another year and a half. <laughs> Anyhow, to your point is, we went into the Women's March, as you know, we put together these unity principles. It was women of color who put the unity principles together. Let me tell you why. Because everybody wanted to march against Trump. It ain't about Trump. Trump is just literally a manifestation of the centuries of oppression in America. He just brought it to the light in a way in modern time that in a way that no one else has. And so for us, we were like, whoa, 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 no, no. We don't march against one man. We stand for things. We believe in things. So we put together unity principles. Then when you went to the 2017 Women's March, you remember, Mothers of the movement, Trayvon Martin's mother, Tamir Rice's mother, right? Lucy McBath, Jordan Davis's mother, who's now in Congress. Undocumented woman from, from I, I had a young Pakistani Muslim girl, many of you know her, Hina Naveed from Staten Island came to the march. We had um, uh, black trans people. We had different kind of Muslims, black Muslims, Arab Muslims, South Asian Muslims, so that people know we're not all the same. We had people from Flint come. So we created a program of literally the most broken people in America and gave them a platform at the march. Let's be very clear, that's not what would have happened if it was only white women organizing that march. In fact, the white woman wanted to do a march about Trump and reproductive rights and equal pay. And when we said, let's have a courageous conversation about this, I said to them, okay, cool, equal pay, important, I'm all in for equal pay. But did you know that even black, while you wanna get paid the same as the white man in America, Black women still don't get paid the same as the white woman. And the immigrant woman doesn't get paid the same as the black woman and the white woman. So we can't have a march that doesn't include a conversation about racial justice. And then when we started talking about immigrant rights, they were like, but what does immigrant rights got to do with the women's rights? What is criminal, I'm serious. And it was fine. I was very happy to do the labor in that moment to explain this intersectional type of movement that I wanted to be a part of. Like when you bring a woman from Flint to the, to, the, to, the, to the stage, it's important for people to understand why a woman from Flint is still part of the women's rights movement, although she's talking about clean water, because guess what? Women and everybody deserve to have access to clean water. It is a, a women's rights issue. So for us, we went there because we felt like it was an opportunity. And I call me a hopeful optimist, because they told us it wasn't gonna work. And to be quite honest to you, I still question today if it's gonna work. 
Because what has happened in the Women's March is that whenever some white woman gets uncomfortable with us, the immediate, the immediate response is like, if we don't like it, if we're feeling uncomfortable, we're going to destroy it. We're going to bring it all down. Burn the whole house down. This is just historically how feminism has worked in this country. That's why we don't have an intersectional feminist movement in America. Did anybody ever wonder why? It's because it just never worked. And we thought we could make it work. And guess what? We're still trying. And what I'm asking people when you look at the Women's March, we're flawed leaders. We're a flawed organization. We've only been around for two years. We're a startup. If you want to make the Women's March better, join it. Come to the table. Organize. So that's all I'm saying is that this is a hard movement. It's not going to be easy. Again, unity is not uniformity. You're not coming to a movement where you're going to agree with everyone. And we have different experiences. And we also come from complicated communities. Everybody comes from a complicated community. We have complicated, complex identities. But we got to figure out how to organize together. So if the women's movement, that's the current movement, goes down, it's just going to be a perpetual story that White women and women of color can't organize together. Unless you want to break the cycle. I'm a cycle breaker. That's why I'm still here. I'm taking all the stress. I'll take every headline. I'm still moving forward. And I hope you join us. And I hope when we do do something that makes you feel uncomfortable, that you come talk to me about it. Just have a conversation about what makes you feel uncomfortable. Because that's not what's happening. And I think there is still a little promise. The real test is going to be for the women's movement is going to be 2020. Because the reason why we got into the, this situation in the first place is because 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump. Let's just be real. So when 2020 comes around, we're going to look at the numbers. And what I ask my white sisters to do is don't worry about what we're doing. Go talk to your white sisters. Go talk to people in, in your family that may live in parts of the country where they may live in more conservative spaces and have these hard conversations. Get disinvited from Thanksgiving and from Christmas. Like, <laughs> if that's what has to happen, but you, we cannot allow it to happen again. And that's what I'm waiting for. I'm hoping 2020 is the moment where we get to say the women's movement and the women's vote is what actually allowed us to defeat fascism in America. Okay, uh, the last question from the audience um, is, this is a question actually that looks more internally. It, it asks, how do we address anti-blackness and racism within Muslim spaces? And I think that's a good question. Absolutely. For, yeah. that's a, let, me, let me just be very clear. About seven years ago, maybe eight years ago, I worked on a campaign with um, an African-American imam from Detroit, another Arab-American sister um, from Syria, um, another brother who's Lebanese American, and we, did, we started a campaign called Drop the A Word. There's a word that we use in Arabic um, that's used often, um, and it's the word that translates into slave, and people use it sometimes to describe black people. And a lot of young children of immigrants actually use it thinking that it means black people, especially if they're not fluent in the Arabic language. And so this campaign was an opportunity for us to start a real courageous conversation within the Muslim American community about anti-black racism. It exists, and I'm not gonna deny it, and I'm not gonna try to defend the reputation of the Muslim community, because it, 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 anti-black racism exists amongst all communities. It's amongst the Jewish community, it's amongst Muslim communities, it's amongst Arab American communities, it's, it, it, it's amongst Latino communities, it's amongst Asian American communities, it's amongst all of our communities. And that's one of the reasons why I have committed myself, and I've said this all the time, and I've said this many times before, as a Muslim American, like I always say to Muslims, I didn't need Black Lives Matter hashtag like five years ago to tell me that Black Lives Matter. I follow a faith that's an, actually an anti-racist religion. So anti-black racism is actually not natural to Muslims or to Islam. It's colonialism. It's, we've, been, we've, been, we've been like trained to be anti-black because of the way in which the world has, and particularly the United States has, treated the concept of race. And so we have to take responsibility by unlearning the racism that we've been taught. And sometimes that requires us to do many things. Number one, to acknowledge that anti-black racism is a thing. Number two, to commit to addressing it, which means sometimes, like, we, I'm not asking people to start campaigns. You got to call it out when you see it and when you hear it. If you hear it in your family, if you hear it at the MSA, if you hear it amongst a group of friends, you got to... Stop it right there. You got to intervene in the on the spot. 
And that's really what it is to combat any form of racism. You got to recognize that it exists and you got to call it out immediately. You can't just let it fester. And you can't say, well, that's my sister, that's my cousin. It doesn't matter. In fact, the ones that you love are the ones that you should be able to have the conversation with much more effectively. And so that's why as a Palestinian American in this country, and this is for everybody, when black people are free in America, you're going to be free. That's it. Women will be free, indigenous people will be free, Latinos will be free, everybody. Muslims will be free, Jews will be free, we will all be free. And so, and I want to, can I just address this woman's question? Yes, yes. So let me, let me address this sister's question in the back, because she has a very important question. So her question is, and this is very important, because this is why we come to these spaces. I'm not here to preach to the choir. I could do that, all. I, I, I mean, it's, it doesn't do anything for me to speak to people who already agree with me. Her question is, what about Muslim women in the Muslim world, right? So let me make some clarification, because that's a great question. And that's an important question for us to talk about. So I want to use a specific example to illustrate her question and also illustrate my answer to the question. I choose to wear hijab. I have agency over myself and my body to choose to wear hijab. But we also have women who are Muslim in places like Iran who are being forced by their government to wear hijab. And in fact, if they protest the government, many of them are arrested and punished in very severe ways. That is unacceptable and outrageous. And all of us should be standing against any government who forces women to do anything that they don't want to do. So let's hold that for a second, right? So let's hold that truth right there. Governments like Iran who force women to wear hijab and punish women for taking off their hijab is absolutely unacceptable and outrageous and we should all be outraged about that. So that's one. But if you're going to be outraged over women in Iran who are forced to wear hijab, then I hope that you are also outraged at countries like France, right, who ban women from wearing hijab in public sector jobs, right, in universities, right? So women who want to go to universities in France are not allowed to wear hijab. For God's sakes, we can't even go to the damn beach and wear burkinis. So all I'm saying to people, if you're going to act like you're the, you know, the, the voice of the oppressed Muslim woman in Iran, then you better be the voice of all oppressed Muslim women all over the world in different ways. And that's all I'm saying. I'm cons I, am consistent in my, I am consistent in my outrage. And the problem with those who are in opposition to me, they are inconsistent in their outrage. There are 600 people about or so in this room. Guess what, sister? If you are really passionate about something, if something really moves you, why don't you start a campaign? I'll be happy to join it. The issue, the, also the issue here is, the issue here is, is that this is the issue. The issue is, I'm one person. I got laundry to do when I get home. I also got, by the way, I also got three kids, two of them who are college students. So this idea that I'm supposed to be the champion for everybody in the world is, 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 is unrealistic. It's unrealistic. I can't be, there were 134 Malians who were massacred. Did you say something about that? There are people in Brazil and po political activists being massacred and murdered by the government. Right, like Marisa, right, in, in where, Mariela Franco, where, are, where is everybody when these things are happening? We have human rights violations in places like North Korea. We have a Saudi government who engages in human rights violations every single day. And guess what we did in the United States? We sold them the largest arms deal to kill more Muslims. How about that? So my, 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 my ask and desire always for people is this. Stop waiting for me to do everything. Stop worrying about what I say when I say I'm one person. You are passionate about something, why don't you get up and do something? You have the power just like I have the power. We all have ways to support. There are organizations supporting Iranian women and doing legal services, fund them. There are women who are supporting women all over the world. People in Somalia, in Sudan, there's currently an uprising in Sudan. Everybody needs to stand up and support. There are Syrian refugees. There are people, refugees at the border who need your support, asylum seekers that need your support. There are people dying without health care. There are people in our societies who are, in, are, are, are victims of all kinds of violence, whether it be gun violence or police violence. Everybody has to, everybody has to get up and do something.
with all these wonderful people who have come to support and to listen to you talk. APA, who... Uh, who organized, organized this talk in the Skirball Center, who hosted you. So we thank everyone for making this possible. My question to you is this, which is, in these dark times of rising white supremacy, of, as you said, a fascist in government, not just in this country, but around the world, we have hard right in power in so many places. What gives you hope? What, what makes you um, so optimistic, as you said, in such dark times? I love that question because I think a lot of times when people are asked that question, they say that hope fuels them, that they have. I'm actually, hope is not what fuels me to do this work. Um, it's love. I love my children. I believe that my children deserve to be in a country and live in a country that loves them and respects them and that allows them to be everything that they are. And so for me, I love my community. I love the community that I come from. I love my allies. I love my friends and I love the work that I do. So for me, what fuels me is love. And the reason why I love is because love is something that like, you don't stop loving your family. You don't stop loving your children. So that means that I'm going to have that for a really long time. And that's what fuels me to do this work. And what gives me the hope in the way that you framed it is these, these students give me hope. Absolutely. Like, when I think about this generation after me, when I watch and I'm, look, I'm actually looking at the aud audience and I see young black Muslim, I see people of all different shades. I know there are some Palestinians, African, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans. I see white Jewish allies, including from within the school and outside the school. This is what gives me hope. This is what people don't want. People don't want to see us organizing together and building together and building power together and being progressive and standing up for one another. So that's what gives me hope every day when I go out into the movement and I see us organizing, building, learning each other's stories. And then for me, when I wake up in the morning, my kids know what I'm doing when I leave the house every morning. They know I'm going to fight like hell with everything that I have for them. And that's what, when I, when I have to face, when you have to face somebody that you're responsible for, that, that's what fuels me to do this work. So we're going to win. It's, an, it's inevitable that we're gonna win. It may not be as fast as we want to, but the idea here is that we have to do everything that we can to love and protect one another and not allow anybody to divide us because the divisions is what's going to make us even more, more vulnerable than we already are right now. And eventually these types of folks, they're gasping their last breaths, they're losing power, and they're taking it out on me, and that's okay, and I'm happy to be that. I'm happy to be that. If, 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 if that makes you feel better, if if trolling me online makes you feel better, if writing an op-ed so you can put out your pain and trauma about how your country is moving in a different direction than you are or that you're losing, your position is not the mainstream position and, and taking it out, out on me is the way to go, I'm in. I'm cool. And I'm happy to be of service. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, everyone, for... Um